Hey, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Esoteric Literacy. Uh, today is a, is a fundamental topic uh, when dealing with really any way of gathering knowledge. So you could say it's you know a fundamental topic to spirituality, to occultism, to science, to all of it. And it is one of those things that is so obvious and so fundamental that most people just overlook it. You know, it's, it's just right in, under everyone's nose, and nobody considers it to be of importance. Or I should say very few people consider it to be of importance. And that is, you know, your five senses. How do they work? Do they give you an accurate picture of reality? So we'll be talking today about Maya, which is a t term in the Sanskrit that loosely means illusion, and, uh, and the five senses. So firstly, to understand your five physical sense organs is, uh, is not too difficult if you just look at it from an anatomical perspective at first. There are different organs, your eyeballs, your ears, your tongue, your skin, uh, and your olfactory uh, nerve endings in your nose and sinuses. And these things you see through your eyes, you hear through your ears, you smell through your nose, you taste through your tongue, and you feel through your skin. Now, when you get an external stimuli, uh, the, the st or stimulus, the stimulus interacts with certain nerve endings in these sense organs. Those nerve endings uh, create an electrical signal, an electrical charge that travels through your nervous system. The, the rest of the dendritic nerves in your body that get, get to your spinal cord and up through your spinal cord into your brain, your brain translates that electrical signal into a perception, and then that perception is perceived by you, whatever you are, whatever the I, you know, the capital letter I is, is what perceives what your brain translates from its environment. So the first thing that needs to be considered is, are you really seeing your environment? If the environmental stimulus is being translated into an electrical signal, and that electrical signal is again being translated by your brain into a percept, or a perception, is this double translation of information accurate? It's going through two layers of information. You have your actual environment getting translated once by the sense organ, and then getting translated a second time by the brain, and perhaps even getting translated a third time by your consciousness. That's a little less clear. Your consciousness probably doesn't translate it a third time. It probably just perceives what the brain translates it as. But anyway, uh, when, you, when you think about it on that fundamental level, you can start to doubt the efficacy of your five senses. And with good reason, because... Uh, now, I don't condone this, but um, if anyone has ever done hallucinogenic compounds like psilocybin or DMT or LSD or anything like that, then you know right away that your senses can be easily manipulated just by a small change in brain chemistry or physical anatomical chemistry. And when you are under the influence of one of these compounds, especially something like shrooms or DMT, like psilocybin or DMT, that world you're experiencing is as real as this world, as this sober, quote-unquote, normal consciousness you're experiencing. It's just as real. You'll see the sky turning into strange shapes, the clouds or whatever. You'll see trees in the distance bending to the ground. You'll, you know, you'll have a conversation with the Ben Ben bird, a blue phoenix that will telepathically talk to you and you'll see it right in front of you. And like the guy next to you who's sober won't be seeing it, <laughs> you know, but it's to you, it's totally real. It's, it's really happening. You'll see flowers opening and closing. And if you put your hand on them, you'll feel the flower opening and closing against your hand. Uh, so it is just as real. Like you, you cannot tell the difference between these different states of consciousness, like it, when, you're, when you're on these compounds, it's not like you're sitting there like, oh, this is a hallucination. This isn't actually happening. No, it, it really is happening to you. 
as though you're in this normal sober consciousness is just as real so just with a, a small change to your biological chemistry you can exist in a totally different world to have totally different perceptions so who's to say that your normal sober consciousness is any more real than the consciousness that you experience when you're under the influence of one of these compounds and this is when empiricists or positivists will tell you well because everybody experiences this normal thing and so they believe in consensus reality and this is one of the fundamental flaws with positivism or empiricism what we call science or modern science is that uh, they believe that the more people who experience a thing, the more true it is. You know, they talk about repeating experiments in a laboratory, different experimenters coming to the same conclusions, more, m more than one person experiencing the same thing. This is, this is what's known as consensus building, or consensus reality. And modern scientists and academics believe in consensus reality. The more people who believe something, the more people who experience something, the more true it is. And this is a fundamental flaw, because if we lived on a planet say or if we if our species was like all blind let's say consensus reality would be utterly different than what it is to a species who can see you know they would say like oh about 12 hours out of the day we feel a strange warmth coming from the sky you know they wouldn't be able to see the sun they'd be blind so they would have this consensus reality that half the day um there is, you know, they'll, they'll just imagine whatever they might imagine, something about creating warmth from the sky, and that's their reality. They'll have no idea what it is. They'll come up with theories to explain it, um, and everyone will agree on it, and everybody will experience it, and it will not necessarily be the truth. Whatever theories they come up with, they won't be seeing the star, the sun itself. They'll be imagining something else. So we only have five senses. It's not like we have 12 senses or something. We only have five, you know. There could be more senses that are locked up. You know, we, we could be those blind people um, imagining things incorrectly, theorizing things incorrectly. And uh, there's no way to know by using your five senses to find out. You need to uh, come to a determination in a different way. This is the fundamental flaw of science. They assume that their five senses are giving them an accurate report of the environment. It's just an assumption. They have no proof of this. Scientists don't know that what they're seeing is what's really in the environment. What they're hearing is what's really in the environment. They assume it is. And then they base all of their theories on <clears throat> what their five senses report to their consciousness. They look through a microscope and see a certain thing. They look through a telescope and see a certain thing. They carry out an experiment and witness a certain thing. And then they theorize based on what they just perceived. But the thing is, if, if you're getting an inaccurate report of what you are perceiving, then your theory means literally nothing. Or it means very little. It's like using a ruler to measure another ruler. It's like, it's arbitrary. If, if the world you're witnessing is an illusion, you cannot prove whether or not it is an illusion. And then you're just studying the phenomena of the illusion then your theories are based on illusion and the perceptions of illusion. This is the, this is the problem with externally oriented ideologies and sciences, what you could call empiricism, what it used to be called in, uh, positivism. And that's, um, that's something that modern scientists will probably never look into because uh, they don't believe in an inner world. So if you want to actually understand whether or not your senses are giving you an accurate report of reality, you must turn your senses in on themselves. You must turn your consciousness in on itself. Turn your awareness in on itself. This is what is referred to as meditation. And this is how you, you follow your senses back to their origin, to their source. Whatever that source is, you can follow one of your senses back. Um, the easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is what's known as nada yoga. Now, nada means sound or stream, kind of means sound stream. Um, and nada yoga is when you listen to 
the different layers of sound that get subtler and subtler. I'll do a whole video on, I actually have a whole lecture planned on Nada Yoga and, and sound, but uh, just for the sake of this video, um, there are four or five layers of sound, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, there's the sounds of your environment that you can hear with your ears. There's the sounds of your biology. When you start to tune out the sounds of your environment, you can hear like the blood rushing through your ear, or maybe you have tinnitus or something. And then there's a third layer of sound, which is um, the sounds of your thoughts. You know, people have an inner voice, you know, when you think a thought and like it's kind of like a sound. You can like hear yourself speaking in your head or you can hear the melody of that song that, that's stuck in your head. And then the fourth layer of sound is the nadi, the, uh, the spiritual sound of creation. You know, how everything vibrates, the source of creation is, is a vibration that then manifests in all sorts of different uh, phenomena. That's the fourth layer of sound. Then you could say there's a fifth layer of sound that is like the all-absolute transcendent silence. And, uh, but, you know, that's, is that a sound or is it not kind of a thing? But anyway, um, that's like the easiest sense to track back into its source is by going, falling through these four layers of sound, following them back. And uh, it's just, I've just noticed that scientists don't do this sort of thing. They'd rather have somebody else do it. Like they'll, they'll put an EKG machine or an EEG and blood pressure gauges and blood chemistry uh, gauges and things like that on a yogi, and then they'll observe what their machines tell them as the yogi goes into these meditative states. The scientists don't do it. The scientists just want to observe the physiology of the yogi, the brain waves of the, of the yogi, the electrical activity of the nervous system of the yogi. And they're not experiencing what the yogi is experiencing. They're just looking at readouts on a machine. And that's not going to help you. I mean, it'll help you understand the physiology of a yogi in a meditative state, but it's not going to help you understand yourself or your, your own consciousness. It's not going to do anything for you. The scientists themselves have to do these things. The scientist has to learn the meditation technique and do it and experience it. And then there was a big stigma placed on that back in the 1960s where scientists were doing that. And then all the academics and other scientists in the mainstream were like, you can't do that. You know, it's like going native when an anthropologist goes native. It's like, you're not supposed to actually do it because now your, your mind is corrupted. Now you're too close to the phenomenon. You're in the phenomenon. You can't interpret it from an objective external standpoint. And empiricism is obsessed with this idea of objectivity. You have to remove yourself from your experiment as much as possible. You know, um, you have to get rid of you, all of your connections to your experiment and just observe as if you can just be like a completely detached eyeball observing an experiment. Well, newsflash to you guys, it's not possible. You exist in this world and you're connected to everything around you. You cannot separate yourself from your experiment. You cannot separate yourself from your observations. They are a fundamentally connected aspect of your psyche because you are, you're witnessing it. It is entering into your consciousness. It is a perception and there is a, an outward and an inward part of perception and you are connected to your experiment. And thankfully, some modern scientists have uh, stumbled upon the observer effect. You know, you have Schrodinger's cat which was developed into the observer effect where like if depending on who's observing the experiment, how many people are observing the experiment, the mental state of the observers, the experiment will produce different results. This is very popular in parapsychology, especially with like things like dice rolls and determining what face of the die is going to show up. And um, there's all sorts of parapsychological studies that have shown that the mental state of the scientist is just as important as the mental state of the uh, subject, the person who has allegedly parapsychological abilities. That they're both interacting with the experiment in the same amount. They've determined that even with the most gifted, like people who have, let's say, uh, telekinesis or telepathy or, or all the other abilities that parapsychologists study, um, even the most gifted uh, psychics, parapsychological subjects, will have uh, less active results if the experimenter is not in the mood for the experiment. If the scientist is like 
believes it's not true and not going to work, if they're biased, if they go into the experiment thinking this is not true and this will not work, then uh, the subject will actually have fewer positive results. And if the scientist goes in thinking this is totally true, this is totally going to work, the subject will have more positive results. And if the person tries to be, if the scientist tries to be as objective as possible, um, the results are up and down and give and take. And this, uh, again, because it's in the realm of parapsychology, it's considered a fringe topic or a pseudoscience, even to, to this day, except, of course, the intelligence agencies who obviously love parapsychology. And then they tell everyone else, no, we don't study parapsychology. There's no such thing as, 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 as any of that. And we don't remote view our enemies, no. Because they don't want you to know about their programs. So in the mainstream, it's, it's uh, derided as pseudoscience and you can't really get uh, funding for it. And it's a liminal topic and, you know, liminal institutions are very ephemeral and get destroyed very easily. If someone's interested in parapsychology and builds an institution around parapsychological studies, um, it won't get much funding. When that guy dies of old age or whatever, the institution will probably collapse around him. Um, never to come back. This happens to all parapsychology institutes is because they're so liminal and they exist in that liminal phase, uh, those institutions don't last very long just by the nature of liminality. But the, uh, f the assumption that your five senses give you an accurate report of reality is a failure at the outset of your spiritual awakening or any or even your scientific endeavors if you at the beginning if you believe your five senses and your your outwardly facing externally oriented five senses are giving you an accurate depiction of reality you've already failed before you've begun that's it's a belief this is a dogmatic belief and like the buddha says you should have no beliefs you should empty yourself from beliefs this isn't about belief this is about falsehood and truth. You either know something or you don't know something. There's none of this belief. So if you have assumptions about the way your mind works while you're trying to explore what reality is, you've already failed. You, you, you've basically put square wheels on your car. You're not going to go anywhere. So if you purge yourself of the assumptions that science unfortunately has, and that a lot of New Agers unfortunately have, a lot of religious people have, all these different ways of gaining knowledge are full of people who have assumptions about it. Religious people have the assumption that their scriptures are divinely ori originated. They assume the scriptures all tell the truth, and that they're completely accurate. That's an assumption. There's no proof of this. It may be true, it may not be true. It may be somewhat true, it may be somewhat false, but thinking one way or the other about it is an assumption. The empiricists, positivists, scientists, whatever you want to call them, have the assumption that the five senses work properly and are completely accurate, and that the environment is what you perceive it to be, and that's an assumption. And New Agers assume all sorts of things. Again, there are as many different New Age beliefs as there are New Agers, and they'll just assume something they read from Blavatsky is true or something that they read from uh, Deepak Chopra is true, something that they read from Eckhart Tolle is true. They'll just, they'll just assume it's true because these people sound smart and spiritual and they don't investigate it. Um, they don't research it uh, with their own cognizance. They just sort of start from assumptions. So yeah, that I guess this is, this is a short uh, lecture. I just wanted to... Um, cover this because I, I realize I don't think I, I covered it in, in earlier videos when I should have because again it's one of those things that's so obvious you don't think to talk about it um, because to me it's been so obvious my whole life when I was a little kid I used to talk about stuff like this like who's hearing what my ears are hearing you know who is seeing what my eyes are seeing and like I drive the adults crazy They're like what the hell are you talking about who is seeing you're seeing what your eyes are seeing it's like yeah but who am I like, my eyes see something, and then I perceive it. Who, who is that? Who is seeing what my eyes are seeing? 
like my eyes aren't just seeing it i am seeing it so what what am i you know and i had these questions and adults would just like throw their hands up in the air and sigh and say you shouldn't be thinking about things like this and at uh you know, I, I would, I'd be like, why do we see, you know, with our organs and not our, you know, like, why do we see with our eyeballs and not our ears? Or like, you know, just trying to ask, I asked all these weird questions when I was a kid. And when I had my first hallucinogenic experience when I was a teenager, um, now I don't do that stuff anymore. I stopped doing that stuff when I was 18. Uh, I don't recommend it, I think. Because what I, what I learned was, you know, I was doing it as, as a explorer of consciousness. I was not just doing it recreationally or for fun like a lot of people do. Like, oh, let's get high. Like, no, I was doing it because it was like a, a ceremonial or shamanic way of exploring your own consciousness. And after doing it a handful of times, I realized like, oh, this is not an upward movement of consciousness. This is what Westerners are so mistaken by. I think it was, uh, was it? Neem Karoli Baba, I can't remember, but somebody, like, gave this Eastern mystic in the 70s, I believe, a whole bunch of LSD, and it hardly affected him. I, well, I mean, I, it affected him in that he understood what it was doing, and, and he called it Western Man's Daydream. And I realized the same thing, is that this is not an upward movement of consciousness. All these Americans, or Westerners, Western Europeans and Americans, think that these drugs are an upward movement of consciousness, that they give you a more spiritual way of looking at things, and it doesn't. It's a sideways movement of consciousness. You're basically trading one set of illusions and percepts for another set of illusions and percepts. and you're not really seeing any higher realm, you're seeing a, a sidestep realm, what people could call the lower astral, even the etheric, even lower than the lower astral would be the etheric or vital forces realm, which is basically just the energetic side of physical matter. And so it's a sideways step in consciousness. And yeah, you can see different beings that populate these areas like elementals and, and whatnot, maybe some lower astral beings or some etheric entities, uh, but those are not higher beings. Those are just beings that are normally invisible. And But what I did learn was that, what I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, is that, oh, well, you can easily manipulate your five senses. You just change your body chemistry just a little tiny bit, and you're in a different world. So your five senses clearly are not reporting to you what you think they're reporting to you. They could be reporting something totally other than reality. You know, you have the whole brain in the vat thing. Was that Heidegger who said, who, who, I can't remember the philosopher, but like the idea that like you might not even exist as a human being in this world. You could just be a brain in a vat getting different electrical and magnetic stimuli, uh, making you perceive this world. Like, kind of like, you know, I think part of the Matrix movie was based on this idea. And yeah, that's, uh, you look at what intelligence agents can do with the V2K technology, the voice to skull technology. They just tight beam, a microwave beam at someone's head, and then that person is hearing voices, you know? Um, the the dude who, is put, who made that electromagnetic helmet, and, like, you just wave certain frequencies of electromagnet force into certain parts of the brain, and, like, he could get people to have religious experiences, and the religious experience would show up based on their uh, preconceived beliefs, like Christians would see Christ, Buddhists would see Buddha, and things like that just because he was zapping their brains with a magnet and uh, he could give people nightmares or he could give people pleasant dreams he could make people feel bliss he could make people feel fear just by zapping their brains with uh, with just a magnetic force so your perceptions are very easily manipulated they're very mutable they're not as solid as scientists want you to believe they are so the most important thing to do at the beginning of your spiritual journey or your scientific endeavors, whatever it is, is to learn a meditation where you follow things back to your source. Whether it's not a yoga and you're following sound back to its source, or if it's um, emotional awareness where you feel an emotion and you trace the emotion back to where it originated. Uh, if you do the sort of mantra yoga where you follow your thoughts back to their source um, 
it's or you know do combinations of all of these things uh, find the techniques that work for you that are appropriate for your mental state and emotional state and those are the first things you ought to be doing before you're like reading books that are all about these different dogmas and how the cosmos is laid out and these starseed beings that are going to talk to you and 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 the all the different dogmas and you know all, like opening up a chemistry textbook and reading about atoms and molecules which technically don't even exist cuz there's really no such thing as an atom, it's just a little whirlpool of energy. So like particle physics and quantum physics is fundamentally flawed because it's based on a theory of tiny pieces. And those tiny pieces aren't really pieces, they're not solid pieces at all, they're just little whirlpools of energy. And they change depending on how you look at them. That's the observer effect that quantum physicists have started to discover. So we have these assumptions going into things and instead of just getting into textbooks and scriptures and dogmas and this and that, the first thing you need to do is sort out your own mind. You can't understand a religious scripture unless you understand how your mind works. You can't understand a science textbook unless you understand how your mind works. You can't look into a telescope and observe something unless you know what that observation effect is. And nobody does this. So few people do this. Uh, there, was a, there was a guy... I think it was actually Deepak Chopra. I know I've been talking shit about him, but he did he did something really funny years ago. He went to a whole lecture full of psychologists, like doctors of psychology, and he asked them, uh, how many of you in your college classes ever took a class on the human mind and what the human mind is? Not a single one raised their hand. There were like 250 people in this room. So doctors of psychology don't even know what the human mind is, have never taken a class on what is the nature of the human mind. They just assume they already know what it is, or they assume that they don't have to even learn about it because it is something we use all day, every day. It is something that is so obvious that we overlook it. So I'm urging you to not overlook the obvious and fundamental things, to, to turn your consciousness back in on itself. Become aware of your own awareness. Follow your awareness back to its origin and discover what you find there. I can't explain to you what you'll find there because it is transcendent and beyond concept, which means it's far beyond words. You can have analogies and metaphors for it, but I'm not going to waste your time with parables. Parables are for the masses, and if you're watching these videos, you're probably not one of the masses. You're probably more advanced in your spiritual journey than that. If you've taken the time to even bother clicking on my videos, it's pr you probably don't need to hear parables from me. You need to have the experience yourself to follow your emotions, your senses, and your thoughts back to their source by just sitting with it. Just pick a sense, pick a thought, pick a brain, a mind process, pick an emotion, and do your best to follow it back to its source, and you will experience the source of that over a certain period of time with diligent and committed and dedicated practice. It will unfold for you. You will witness the source of these things. And that, that is the most important step to anything. And then you will become essentially resistant to lies. This is what will help you um, expand your discernment and your intuition. You'll be able to see things more clearly. You'll be able to see falsehoods from truths much more clearly. And you'll be able to purge yourself of beliefs and assumptions and you'll be like, I either know something or I don't know something. And if I don't know it, I'm fine with it in the meantime. I'll try to know it. I'll endeavor to know it. But I'm not going to fill in the blanks with beliefs and opinions. I'll just be fine with paradox. I'll be fine with an empty mind of not knowing until I know it. So thank you very much for watching. I hope this was useful to you. And I will see you next time. Take care.